Part two, chapter ten of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Appeal to Caesar. The room was full of sunshine that poured in through two tall windows opposite upon a motionless figure that sat in a high carved chair by the table and watched the door. This figure dominated the whole room. The lad, as he dropped on his knees, was conscious of eyes watching him from behind the chair of tapestried walls and a lute that lay on the table but all those things were but trifling accessories to that scarlet central figure with a burnished halo of auburn hair round a shadowed face there was complete silence for a minute or two a hound bayed in the court outside and there came a faraway bang of a door somewhere in the palace there was a rustle of silk that set every nerve of his body thrilling, and then a clear, hard, penetrating voice spoke two words. "'Well, sir?' Anthony drew a breath and swallowed in his throat. "'Your grace,' he said, and lifted his eyes for a moment and dropped them again. But in the glimpse every detail stamped itself clear on his imagination— there she sat in vivid scarlet and cloth of gold radiating light with high puffed sleeves an immense ruff fringed with lace the narrow eyes were fixed on him and as he now waited again he knew that they were running up and down his figure his dark splashed hose and his tumbled doublet and ruff you come strangely dressed anthony drew a quick breath again my heart is sick he said there was another slight movement well sir the voice said again you have not told us why you are here for justice from my queen he said and stopped and for mercy from a woman he added scarcely knowing what he said again elizabeth stirred in her chair you taught him that you wicked girl she said no madam came mary's voice from behind subdued and entreating it is his heart that speaks enough sir said elizabeth now tell us plainly what you want of us then anthony thought it time to be bold he made a great effort and the sense of constraint relaxed a little i have been your grace to sir francis walsingham and my lord bishop of london and i can get neither justice nor mercy from either and so i come to your grace who are their mistress to teach them manners stay said elizabeth that is insolence to my ministers so my lord said answered anthony frankly looking into that hard clear face that was beginning to be lined with age and he saw that elizabeth smiled and that the face behind the chair nodded at him encouragingly well insolence go on it is on behalf of one who has been pronounced a felon and a traitor by your grace's laws that i am pleading but one who is a very gallant christian gentleman as well your friend lacks not courage interrupted elizabeth to mary no your grace said the other that has never been considered his failing anthony waited and then the voice spoke again harshly go on with the tale sir i cannot be here all day he is a popish priest your majesty and he was taken at mass in his vestments and is now in the tower and he hath been questioned on the rack and madam it is piteous to think of it he is but a young man still but passing strong and tall what has this to do with me sir interrupted the queen harshly i cannot pardon every proper young priest in the kingdom what else is there to be said for him he was taken through the foul treachery of a spy who imposed upon me his friend and caused me all unknowing to say the very words that brought him into the net and then more and more anthony began to lose his self-consciousness and poured out the story from the beginning telling how he had been brought up in the same village with james maxwell and what a loyal gentleman he was and then the story of the trick by which he had been deceived as he spoke his whole appearance seemed to change 
instead of the shy and rather clumsy manner with which he had begun he was now natural and free he moved his hands in slight gestures his blue eyes looked the queen fairly in the face he moved a little forward on his knees as he pleaded and he spoke with a passion that astonished both mary and himself afterwards when he thought of it in spite of his short and broken sentences he was conscious all the while of an intense external strain and pressure as if he were pleading for his life and the time was short elizabeth relaxed her rigid attitude and leaned her chin on her hand and her elbow on the table and watched him her thin lips parted the pearl rope and crown on her head and the pearl pendants in her ears moving slightly as she nodded at points in his story ah your grace he cried lifting his open hands towards her a little you have a woman's heart all your people say so you cannot allow this man to be so trapped to his death treachery never helped a cause yet if your men cannot catch these priests fairly then a god's name let them not catch them at all but to use a friend and make a judas of him to make the very lips that have spoken friendly speak traitorously to bait the trap like that it is devilish let him go let him go madam one priest more or less cannot overthrow the realm but one more foul crime done in the name of justice can bring god's wrath down on the nation i hold that a trick like that is far worse than all the disobedience in the world nay how can we cry out against the jesuits and the plotters if we do worse ourselves madam madam let him go oh i know i cannot speak as well in this good cause as some can in a bad cause but let the cause speak for itself i cannot speak i know nay nay said elizabeth softly you wrong yourself you have an honest face sir and that is the best recommendation to me and so minnie she went on turning to mary this was your petition was it and this your advocate well you have not chosen badly now you speak yourself mary stood a moment silent and then with a swift movement came round the arm of the queen's chair and threw herself on her knees with her hands upon the queen's left hand as it lay upon the carved boss and her voice was as anthony had never yet heard it vibrant and full of tears oh madam madam this poor lad cannot speak as he says and yet his sad honest face as your grace said is more eloquent than all words and think of the silence of the little cell upstairs in the tower where a gallant gentleman lies all rent and torn with the rack and and how he listens for the footsteps outside of the tormentors who come to drag him down again all aching and heavy with pain down to that fierce engine in the dark and think of his gallant heart your grace how brave it is and how he will not yield nor let one name escape him ah oh, not because he loves not your grace nor desires to serve you but because he serves your grace best by serving and loving his god first of all and think how he cannot help a sob now and again and whispers the name of his saviour as the pulleys begin to wrench and twist and and do not forget his mother your grace down in the country how she sits and listens and prays for her dear son and cannot sleep and dreams of him when at last she sleeps and wakes screaming and crying at the thought of the boy she bore and nursed in the hands of those harsh devils and and you can stop it all your grace with one little word and make that mother's heart bless your name and pray for you night and morning till she dies and let that gallant son go free and save his racked body before it be torn asunder and you can make this honest lad's heart happy again with the thought that he has saved his friend instead of slaying him look you madam he has come confessing his fault saying bravely to your grace that he did try to do his friend a service in spite of the laws for that he held love to be the highest law and 
how many happy souls you can make with a word because you are a queen what is it to be a queen to be able to do all that oh madam be pitiful then and show mercy as one day you hope to find it mary spoke with an intense feeling her voice was one long straining sob of appeal and as she ended her tears were beginning to rain down on the hand she held between her own she lifted it to her streaming face and kissed it again and again and then dropped her forehead upon it and so rested in dead silence elizabeth swallowed in her throat once or twice and then spoke and her voice was a little choked well well you silly girl you plead too well anthony irresistibly threw his hands out as he knelt oh god bless your grace he said and then gave a sob or two himself there there you are a pair of children she said for mary was kissing her hand again and again and you are a pretty pair too she added now now that is enough stand up anthony rose to his feet again and stood there and mary went round again behind the chair now now you have put me in a sore strait said elizabeth between you i scarcely know how to keep my word they call me fickle enough already but frank walsingham shall do it for me he is certainly at the back of it all and he shall manage it it shall be done at once call a page minnie mary corbett went to the back of the room into the shadow opened a door that anthony had not noticed and beckoned sharply in a moment or two a page was bowing before elizabeth is sir francis walsingham in the palace she asked then bring me him here she ended as the boy bowed again and you too she went on shall hear that i keep my word she pointed towards the door whence the page had come stand there she said and leave the door ajar Mary gave Anthony her hand and a radiant smile as they went together. Aha, uh -huh, said Elizabeth, not in my presence. Anthony flushed with fury in spite of his joy. They went in through the door and found themselves in a tiny panelled room with a little slit of a window. It was used to place a sentry or a page within it. There were a couple of chairs, and the two sat down to wait. Oh, thank God, whispered Anthony again the harsh voice rang out from the open door now now no love-making within there mary smiled and laid her finger on her lips then there came the ripple of a lute from the outer room played not unskilfully mary smiled again and nodded at anthony then a metallic voice but clear enough and tuneful began to sing a verse of the little love song of harrington's whence comes my love it suddenly ceased in the middle of the line and the voice cried to someone to come in anthony could hear the door open and close again and a movement or two which doubtless represented walsingham's obeisance then the queen's voice began again low thin and distinct the two in the inner room listened breathlessly i wish a prisoner in the tower to be released sir francis without any talk or to do and i desire you to do it for me there was silence and then walsingham's deep tone your grace has but to command his name is james maxwell and he is a popish priest a longer silence followed i do not know if your grace knows all the circumstances i do sir or i should not interfere the feeling of the people was very strong well and what of that it will be a risk of your grace's favour with them have i not said that my name was not to, to appear in the matter and do you think i fear my people's wrath there was silence again well sir francis why do you not speak i have nothing to say your grace then it will be done i do not see at present how it can be done but doubtless there is a way then you will find it sir immediately rang out the queen's metallic tones mary turned and nodded solemnly at anthony with pursed lips he was questioned on the rack two days ago your grace have i not said i know all the circumstances do you wish me to say it again the queen was plainly getting angry 
I ask your pardon, madam, but I only meant that he could not travel, probably, yet a while. He was on the rack for four hours, I understand. Anthony felt that strange sickness rise again, but Mary laid her cool hand on his and smiled at him. Well, well, rasped out Elizabeth, I do not ask impossibilities. They would cease to be so, madam, if you did. Mary, within the little room, put her lips to Anthony's ear. Butter, she whispered. Well, sir, went on the queen, you shall see that he has a physician, and leave to travel as soon as he will. It shall be done, your grace. Very well, see to it. I beg your grace's pardon, but what— Well, what is it now? I would wish to know your grace's pleasure as to the future for Mr. Maxwell— is no pledge of good behavior to be exacted from him of course he says mass again at his peril either he must take the oath at once or he shall be allowed forty-eight hours safe conduct with his papers for the continent your grace indeed i must remonstrate then the queen's wrath burst out they heard a swift movement and the rap of her high heels as she sprang to her feet by god's son she screamed am i queen or not i have had enough of your counsel you presume sir her ringed hand came heavily down on the table and they heard the lute leap and fall again you presume on your position sir i made you and i can unmake you and by god i will if i have another word of your counselling be gone and see that it be done i will not bid twice there was silence again and they heard the outer door open and close anthony's heart was beating wildly he had sprung to his feet in a trembling excitement as the queen had sprung to hers the mere ring of that furious royal voice even without the sight of her pale wrathful face and blazing eyes that walsingham looked upon as he backed out from the presence was enough to make this lad's whole frame shiver mary apparently was accustomed to this for she looked up at anthony laughing silently and shrugged her shoulders then they heard the queen's silk draperies rustle and her pearls chink together as she sank down again and took up her lute and struck the strings then the metallic voice began again with a little tremor in it like the ground swell after a storm and she sang the verse through in which she had been interrupted why thus my love so kind bespeak sweet eye sweet lip sweet blushing cheek yet not a heart to save my pain o venus take thy gifts again make not so fair to cause our moan or make a heart that's like your own the lute rippled away into silence mary rose quietly to her feet and nodded to anthony come back you two cried the queen mary stepped straight through the lad behind her well said the queen turning to them and showing her black teeth in a smile have i kept my word ah oh, your grace said mary curtsying to the ground you have made some simple loving hearts very happy to-day i do not mean sir francis the queen laughed come here child she said holding out her glittering hand down here and mary sank down on the queen's footstool and leaned against her knee like a child smiling up into her face while elizabeth put her hand under her chin and kissed her twice on the forehead there there she said caressingly have i made amends am i a hard mistress and she threw her left hand around the girl's neck and began to play with the diamond pendant in her ear and to stroke the smooth curve of her cheek with her flashing fingers anthony a little on one side stood watching and wondering at this silky tigress who raged so fiercely just now elizabeth looked up in a moment and saw him why here is the tall lad here still she said eyeing us as if we were monsters have you never yet seen two maidens loving one another that you stare so with your great eyes aha minnie he would like to be sitting where i am is it not so sir 
"I would sooner stand where I am, madam," said Anthony, by a sudden inspiration, "and look upon your Grace." "Why, he is a courtier already," said the Queen. "You have been giving him lessons, Minnie, you sly girl." "A loyal heart makes the best courtier, madam," said Mary, taking the Queen's hand delicately in her own. "And next to looking upon my Grace, Mr. Norris," said Elizabeth, "what do you best love?" "Listening to your Grace," said Anthony promptly. Mary turned and flashed all her teeth upon him in a smile, and her eyes danced in her head. Elizabeth laughed outright. "'He is an apt pupil,' she said to Mary. "'You mean the lute, sir?' she added. "'I mean your Grace's voice, madam. I had forgotten the lute.' "'Ah, a little clumsy,' said the Queen. "'Not so true a thrust as the others.' "'It was not for lack of good will.' said poor anthony blushing a little he felt in a kind of dream fencing in language with this strange mighty creature in scarlet and pearls who sat up in her chair and darted remarks at him as with a rapier aha said the queen he is blushing look minnie mary looked at him deliberately anthony became scarlet at once and tried a desperate escape it is your livery madam he said mary clapped her hands and glanced at the queen yes minnie he does his mistress credit yes your grace but he can do other things besides talk explained mary anthony felt like a horse being shown off by a skilful dealer but he was more at his ease too after his blush extend your mercy madam he said and bid mistress corbett hold her tongue and spare my shame silence sir said the queen go on minnie what else can he do ah your grace he can hawk oh you should see his peregrine named after your majesty that shows his loyal heart i am not sure of the compliment said the queen hawks are fierce creatures it was not for her fierceness put in anthony that i named her after your grace why then mr norris for that she soars so high above all other creatures said the lad and and that she never stoops but to conquer mary gave a sudden triumphant laugh and glanced up and elizabeth tapped her on the cheek sharply be still bad girl she said you must not prompt during the lesson and so the talk went on anthony really acquitted himself with great credit considering the extreme strangeness of his position but such an intense weight had been lifted off his mind by the queen's pardon of james maxwell that his nature was alight with a kind of intoxication all his sharpness such as it was rose to the surface and mary too was amazed at some of his replies elizabeth took it as a matter of course she was accustomed to this kind of word fencing she did not do it very well herself her royalty gave her many advantages which she often availed herself of and her address was not to be compared for a moment with that of some of her courtiers and ladies but still she was amused by this slender honest lad who stood there before her in his graceful splashed dress and blushed and laughed and parried and delivered his point with force even if not with any extraordinary skill but at last she began to show signs of weariness and mary managed to convey to anthony that it was time to be off so he began to make his adieus well said elizabeth let us see you at supper to-night and in the parlours afterwards ah she cried suddenly neither of you must say a word as to how your friend was released it must remain the act of the council my name must not appear walsingham will see to that and you must see to it too they both promised sincerely well then lad said elizabeth and stretched out her hand and mary rose and stood by her anthony came up and knelt on the cushion and received the slender scented ringed hand on his own and kissed it ardently in his gratitude as he released it it cuffed him gently on the cheek there there said elizabeth minnie has taught you too much it seems anthony backed out of the presence smiling and his last glimpse was once more of the great scarlet-clad figure with the slender waist and the priceless pearls and the haze of muslin behind that crowned auburn head and the pale oval face smiling at him with narrow eyes 
and all in a glory of sunshine he did not see mary corbett again until evening as she was with the queen all the afternoon anthony would have wished to return to lambeth but it was impossible after the command to remain to supper so he wandered down along the river bank rejoicing in the success of his petition and wondering whether james had heard of his release yet of course it was just a fly in the ointment that his own agency in the matter could never be known it would have been at least some sort of compensation for his innocent share in the whole matter of the arrest however he was too happy to feel the sting of it he felt of course greatly drawn to the queen for her ready clemency and yet there was something repellent about her too in spite of it he felt in his heart that it was just a caprice like her blows and caresses and then the assumption of youth sat very ill upon this lean middle-aged woman he would have preferred less lute-playing and sprightly innuendo and more tenderness and gravity mary had arranged that a proper court suit should be at his disposal for supper and a room to himself so after he had returned at sunset he changed his clothes the white silk suit with the high hosen the embroidered doublet with great puffed and slashed sleeves the short green-lined cloak the white cap and feather and the slender sword with the jewelled hilt all became him very well and he found too that mary had provided him with two great emerald brooches of her own that he pinned on one at the fastening of the crisp ruff and the other on his cap he went on to the private chapel for the evening prayer at half-past six which was read by one of the chaplains but there were very few persons present and none of any distinction religion except as a department of politics was no integral part of court life the queen only occasionally attended evening prayer on weekdays and just now she was too busy with the affair of the duke of alencon to spend unnecessary time in that manner when the evening prayer was over he followed the little company into the long gallery that led towards the hall through which the queen's procession would pass to supper and there he attached himself to a group of gentlemen some of whom he had met at lambeth while they were talking the clang of trumpets suddenly broke out from the direction of the queen's apartments and all threw themselves on their knees and remained there the doors were flung open by servants stationed behind them and the wands advanced leading the procession then came the trumpeters blowing mightily with a drum or two beating the step and then in endless profusion servants and guards gentlemen pensioners magnificently habited for they were continually about the queen's person and at last after an official or two bearing swords came the queen and alencon together she in a superb purple toilette with brocaded underskirt and high-heeled twinkling shoes and breathing out essences as she swept by smiling and he a pathetic little brown man pock-marked with an ill-shapen nose and a head too large for his undersized body in a rich velvet suit sparkling all over with diamonds as they passed anthony he heard the duke making some french compliment in his croaking harsh voice behind came the crowd of ladies nodding chattering rustling and anthony had a swift glance of pleasure from mistress corbett as she went by talking at the top of her voice the company followed on to the hall behind the distant trumpeters and anthony found himself still with his friends somewhere at the lower end away from the queen's table who sat with alencon at her side on a dais with the great folks about her all through supper the most astonishing noise went on every one was talking loudly the servants ran to and fro over the paved floor there was a loud clatter over the plates of four hundred persons and to crown all a band in the musicians gallery overhead made brazen music all supper time anthony had enough entertainment himself in looking about the great banqueting hall so magnificently adorned with tapestries and armour and antlers from the park and above all by the blaze of gold and silver plate both on the tables and on the sideboards and by watching the army of liveried servants running to and fro incessantly and the glowing colours of the dresses of the guests supper was over at last and a latin grace was exquisitely sung in four parts by boys and men stationed in the musicians gallery 
and then the Queen's procession went out with the same ceremony as that with which it had entered. Anthony followed behind, as he had been bidden by the Queen, to the private parlours afterwards, but he presently found his way barred by a page at the foot of the stairs leading to the Queen's apartments. It was in vain that he pleaded his invitation. It was useless, as the young gentleman had not been informed of it. Anthony asked if he might see Mistress Corbett no that too was impossible she was gone upstairs with the queen's grace and might not be disturbed anthony in despair not however unmixed with relief at escaping a further ordeal was about to turn away leaving the officious young gentleman swaggering on the stairs like a peacock when down came mistress corbett herself sailing down in her splendour to see what was become of the gentleman of the archbishop's house why here you are she cried from the landing as she came down and why have you not obeyed the queen's command this young gentleman said anthony indicating the astonished page would not let me proceed it is unusual mistress corbett said the boy for her grace's guests to come without my having received instructions unless they are great folk mistress corbett came down the last six steps like a stooping hawk her wings bulged behind her and she caught the boy one clean light cuff on the side of the head you imp she said daring to doubt the word of this gentleman and the queen's grace's own special guest the boy tried still to stand on his dignity and bar the way but it was difficult to be dignified with a ringing head and a scarlet ear stand aside said mary stamping her little buckled foot this instant unless you would be dragged by your red ear before the queen's grace come master anthony so the two went upstairs together and the lad called up after them bitterly i beg your pardon mistress i did not recognize he was your gallant you shall pay for that hissed mary over the banisters they went along a passage or two and the sound of a voice singing to a virginal began to ring nearer as they went followed by a burst of applause lady leicester whispered mary and then she opened the door and they went in there were three rooms opening on one another with wide entrances so that really one long room was the result they were all three fairly full that into which they entered the first in the row was occupied by some gentlemen pensioners and ladies talking and laughing some playing shove groat and some of them still applauding the song that had just ended the middle room was much the same and the third which was a step higher than the others was that in which was the queen with lady leicester and a few more lady leicester had just finished a song and was laying her virginal down there was a great fire burning in the middle room with seats about it and here mary corbett brought anthony those near him eyed him a little but his companion was sufficient warrant of his respectability and they soon got into talk which was suddenly interrupted by the queen's voice from the next room minnie minnie if you can spare a moment from your lad come and help us at a dance the queen was plainly in a high good humour and mary got up and went into the queen's room those round the fire stood up and pushed the seats back and the game ceased in the third room as her grace needed spectators and applause then there arose the rippling of lutes from the ladies in the next room in slow swaying measure with the gentle tap of a drum now and again and the pavan began a stately dignified dance and among all the ladies moved the great queen herself swaying and bending with much grace and dignity it was the strangest thing for anthony to find himself here a raven among all these peacocks and birds of paradise and he wondered at himself and at the strange humour of providence as he watched the shimmer of the dresses and the sparkle of the shoes and jewels and the soft clouds of muslin and lace that shivered and rustled as the ladies stepped the firelight shone through the wide doorway on this glowing movement and groups of candles and sconces within the room increased and steadied the soft intensity of the light the soft tingling instruments with the slow tap-tap marking the measure like a step seemed a translation into chord and melody of this stately tender exercise and so this glorious flower-bed loaded too with the wealth of essences in the dresses and the sweet washed gloves 
swayed under the wind of the music bending and rising together in slow waves and ripples then it ceased and the silence was broken by a quick storm of applause while the dancers waited for the lutes then all the instruments broke out together in a quick triple time the stringed instruments supplying a hasty throbbing accompaniment while the shrill flutes began to whistle and the drums to gallop there was yet a pause in the dance till the queen made the first movement and then the whole whirled off on the wings of a coranto it was bewildering to anthony who had never even dreamed of such a dance before he watched first the lower line of the shoes and the whole floor in reality above and in the mirror of the polished boards below seemed scintillating in lines of diamond light the heavy underskirts of brocade puffed satin and cloth of gold with glimpses of foamy lace beneath whirled and tossed above these flashing vibrations then he looked at the higher strata and there was a tossing sea of faces and white throats borne up as it seemed now revealed now hidden on clouds of undulating muslin and lace with sparkles of precious stones set in rough and wings on high piled hair he watched fascinated the faces as they appeared and vanished there was every imaginable expression the serious looks of one who took dancing as a solemn task and marked her position and considered her steps the wild gaiety of another all white teeth and dimples and eyes intoxicated by movement and music and colour as men are by wine and guided and sustained by the furious genius of the dance rather than by intention of any kind there was the courtly self-restraint of one tall beauty who danced as a pleasant duty and loved it but never lost control of her own bending slender grace ah and there was the oval face crowned with auburn hair and pearls the lower lip drawn up under the black teeth with an effort till it appeared to snarl and the ropes of pearls leaping wildly on her lean purple stomacher and over all the grave oak walls and the bright sconces and the taper flames blown about by the eddying gusts from the whirlpool beneath as anthony went down the square winding staircase an hour later when the evening was over and the keen winter air poured up to meet him his brain was throbbing with the madness of dance and music and whirling colour here it seemed to him lay the secret of life for a few minutes his old day-dreams came back but in more intoxicating dress the figure of mary corbett in her rose-coloured silk and her clouds of black hair and her jewels and her laughing eyes and scarlet mouth and her violet fragrance and her fire this dominated the boy as he walked towards the stables across the starlit court she seemed to move before him to hold out her hands to him to call him her own dear lad to invite him out of the drab-coloured life that lay on all sides behind and before up into a mystic region of jewelled romance where she and he would live and be one in the endless music of rippling strings and shrill flutes and the maddening tap of a little hidden drum but the familiar touch of his own sober suit and the creaking saddle as he rode home to lambeth and the icy wind that sang in the river sedges and the wholesome smell of the horse and the touch of the coarse hair at the shoulder talked and breathed the old puritan common sense back to him again that warm painted melodious world he had left was gaudy nonsense and dancing was not the same as living and mary corbett was not just a rainbow on the foam that would die when the sun went in but both she and he together were human souls redeemed by the death of the saviour with his work to do and no time or energy for folly and james maxwell in the tower thank god however not for long james maxwell with his wrenched joints and forehead and lips wet with agony was in the right and that lean bitter furious woman in the purple and pearls who supped to the blare of trumpets and danced to the ripple of lutes wholly and utterly and eternally in the wrong 
End of chapter 10. Part 2, Chapter 11 of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Station of the Cross Philosophers tell us that the value of existence lies not in the objects perceived, but in the powers of perception. The tragedy of a child over a broken doll is not less poignant than the anguish of a worshipper over a broken idol, or of a king over a ruined realm. Thus the conflict of Isabel during those past autumn and winter months was no less august than the pain of the priest on the rack, or the struggle of his innocent betrayer to rescue him, or the misery of Lady Maxwell over the sorrows that came to her in such different ways through her two sons. Isabel's soul was tender above most souls, and the powers of feeling pain and of sustaining it were also respectively both acute and strong. The sense of pressure, or rather of disruption, became intolerable. She was indeed a soul on the rack. If she had been less conscientious, she would have silenced the voice of divine love that seemed to call to her from the Catholic Church if she had been less natural and feminine she would have trampled out of her soul the appeal of the human love of hubert as it was she was wrenched both ways now the cords at one end or the other would relax a little and the corresponding relief was almost a shock but when she tried to stir and taste the freedom of decision that now seemed in her reach they would tighten again with a snap and she would find herself back on the torture. To herself she seemed powerless. It appeared to her, when she reflected on it consciously, that it was merely a question as to which part of her soul would tear her first, as to which ultimately retained her. She began to be terrified at solitude. The thought of the coming night, with its long hours of questioning and torment until the dawn, haunted her during the day. She would read in her room, or remain at her prayers, in the hopes of distracting herself from the struggle, until sleep seemed the supreme necessity. Then, when she lay down, sleep would flap its wings in mockery and flit away, leaving her wide awake, staring at the darkness of the room, or of her own eyelids, until the windows began to glimmer and the cocks to crow from farm buildings. In spite of her first resolve to fight the battle alone, she soon found herself obliged to tell Mistress Margaret all that was possible, but she felt that to express her sheer need of Hubert, as she thought it, was beyond her altogether. How could a nun understand? My darling, said the old lady, it would not be Calvary without the darkness, and you cannot have Christ without Calvary. Remember that the light of the world makes darkness his secret place, and so you see that if you were able to feel that any human soul really understood, it would mean that the darkness was over. I have suffered that night twice myself. The third time, I think, will be in the valley of death. Isabel only half understood her, but it was something to know that others had tasted the cup, too, and that what was so bitter was not necessarily poisonous. At another time, as the two were walking together under the pines one evening, and the girl had again tried to show to the nun the burning desolation of her soul, Mistress Margaret had suddenly turned listen dear child she said i will tell you a secret over there and she pointed out to where the sunset glowed behind the tree trunks and the slope beyond over there in west grinstead rests our dear lord in the blessed sacrament his body lies lonely neglected and forgotten by all but half a dozen souls well twenty years ago all england reverenced it behold and see if there be any sorrow 
and then the nun stopped as she saw isabel's amazed eyes staring at her but it haunted the girl and comforted her now and then yet in the fierceness of her pain she asked herself again and again was it true was it true was she sacrificing her life for a dream a fairy story or was it true that there the body that had hung on the cross fifteen hundred years ago now rested alone hidden in a silver pyx within locked doors for fear of the jews oh dear lord was it true hubert had kept his word and left the place almost immediately after his last interview and was to return at easter for his final answer christmas had come and gone and it seemed to her as if even the tenderest mysteries of the christian religion had no touch with her now she walked once more in the realm of grace as in the realm of nature an exile from its spirit all her sensitive powers seemed so absorbed in interior pain that there was nothing in her to respond to or appreciate the most keen external impressions as she awoke and looked up on christmas morning early and saw the frosted panes and the snow lying like wool on the crossbars and heard the christmas bells peal out in the listening air as she came downstairs and the old pleasant acrid smell of the evergreens met her and she saw the red berries over each picture and the red heart of the wood fire nay as she knelt at the chancel rails and tried in her heart to adore the rosy child in the manger and received the sacred symbols of his flesh and blood and entreated him to remember his loving kindness that brought him down from heaven yet the whole was far less real less intimate to her than the sound of hubert's voice as he had said good-bye two months ago less real than one of those darting pangs of thought that fell on her heart all day like a shower of arrows and then when the sensitive strings of her soul were stretched to anguish a hand dashed across them striking a wailing discord and they did not break the news of anthony's treachery and still more his silence performed the incredible and doubled her pain without breaking her heart on the tuesday morning early lady maxwell had sent her note by a courier bidding him return at once with the answer the evening had come and he had not appeared the night passed and the morning came and it was not till noon that the man at last arrived saying he had seen mr norris on the previous evening and that he had read the note through there and then and had said there was no answer surely there could be but one explanation of that that no answer was possible it could not be said that isabel actively considered the question and chose to doubt anthony rather than to trust him she was so nearly passive now with the struggle she had gone through that this blow came on her with the overwhelming effect of a hypnotic suggestion her will did not really accept it any more than her intellect really weighed it but she succumbed to it and did not even write again nor question the man further had she done this she might perhaps have found out the truth that the man a stupid rustic with enough shrewdness to lie but not enough to lie cleverly had had his foolish head turned by the buzz of london town and the splendour of lambeth stables and the friendliness of the grooms there and had got heavily drunk on leaving anthony that the answer which he had put into his hat had very naturally fallen out and been lost and that when at last he returned to the country already eight hours after his time and found the note was missing he had stalwartly lied hoping that the note was unimportant and that things would adjust themselves or be forgotten before a day of reckoning should arrive and so isabel's power of resistance collapsed under this last blow and her soul lay still at last almost too much tormented to feel her last hope was gone 
Anthony had betrayed his friend. The week crept by and Saturday came. She went out soon after dinner to see a sick body or two in an outlying hamlet, for she had never forgotten Mrs. Dent's charge, and with the present minister's approval still visited the sick one or two days a week at least. Then towards sunset she came homewards over some high ground on the outskirts of Ashdown Forest. The snow that had fallen before Christmas had melted a week or two ago, and the frost had broken up. It was a heavy, leaden evening, with an angry glow shining, as through the chinks of a wall, from the west towards which she was going. The village lay before her in the gloom, and lights were beginning to glimmer here and there. She contrasted, in a lifeless way, that pleasant group of warm houses, with their suggestions of love and homeliness, with her own desolate self. She passed up through the village towards the hall, whither she was going to report on the invalids to Lady Maxwell, and in the appearance of the houses on either side she thought there was an unaccustomed air. Several doors stood wide open, with the brightness shining out into the twilight, as if the inhabitants had suddenly deserted their homes. Others were still dark and cold, although the evening was drawing on there was not a moving creature to be seen. She passed up, wondering a little, through the gatehouse, and turned into the gravel sweep, and there stopped short at the sight of a great crowd of men and women and children, assembled in dead silence. Someone was standing at the entrance steps, with his head bent as if he were talking to those nearest him in a low voice. As she came up, there ran a whisper of her name, the people drew back to let her through, and she passed, sick with suspense, to the man on the steps, whom she now recognized as Mr. James' body-servant. His face looked odd and drawn, she thought. "'What is it?' she asked in a sharp whisper. "'Mr. James is here, madam. He is with Lady Maxwell in the cloister wing. Will you please to go up?' "'Mr. James?' Uh, it is no news about mr anthony or or mr hubert no madam the man hesitated mr james has been racked madam the man's voice broke in a great sob as he ended ah she reeled against the post a man behind caught her and steadied her and there was a quick breath of pity from the crowd ah oh, poor thing said a woman's voice behind her i beg your pardon madam said the servant i should not have and and he is upstairs he and my lady are together madam she looked at him a moment dazed with the horror of it and then going past him pushed open the door and went through into the inner hall here again she stopped suddenly it was half full of people silent and expectant the men, the grooms, the maid-servants, and even two or three farm men. She heard the rustle of her name from the white faces that looked at her from the gloom, but none moved, and she crossed the hall alone and turned down the lower corridor that led to the cloister wing. At the foot of the staircase she stopped again, her heart drummed in her ears as she listened intently with parted lips. There was a profound silence, the lamp on the stairs had not been lighted, and the terrace window only let in a pale glimmer. It was horrible to her, this secret presence of incarnate pain that brooded somewhere in the house, this silence of living anguish worse than death a thousand times. Where was he? What would it look like? Even a scream somewhere would have relieved her, and snapped the tension of the listening stillness that lay on her like a shocking nightmare. This lobby with its well-known doors, the banister on which her fingers rested, the well of the staircase up which she stared with dilated eyes, all was familiar. And yet, somewhere in the shadows overhead lurked this formidable presence of pain, mute anguished terrifying she longed to run back to shriek for help but she dared not and stood panting she went up a couple of steps 
stopped, listened to the sick thumping of her heart, took another step and stopped again, and so, listening, peering, hesitating, came to the head of the stairs. Ah, there was the door with a line of light beneath it. It was there that the horror dwelt. She stared at the thin, bright line, waited and listened again for even a moan or a sigh from within, but but none came. Then, with a great effort, she stepped forward and tapped. There was no answer. But as she listened, she heard from within the gentle tinkle of some liquid running into a bowl, rhythmically and with pauses. Then again she tapped, nervously and rapidly, and there was a murmur from the room. She opened the door softly, pushed it, and took a step into the room, half-closing it behind her. There were two candles burning on a table in the middle of the room, and on the near side of it was a group of three persons. Isabel had seen in one of Mistress Margaret's prayer books an engraving of an old Flemish pieta, a group of the Blessed Mother holding in her arms the body of her crucified son, with the Magdalen on one side, supporting one of the dead Saviour's hands. Isabel now caught her breath in a sudden gasp, for here was the scene reproduced before her. Lady Maxwell was on a low seat, bending forwards. The white cap and ruff seemed like a veil thrown all about her head and beneath her chin. She was holding in her arms the body of her son, who seemed to have fainted as he sat beside her. His head had fallen back against her breast, and his pointed beard and dark hair, and her black dress beyond, emphasized the deathly whiteness of his face, on which the candlelight fell. His mouth was open like a dead man's. Mistress Margaret was kneeling by his left hand, holding it over a basin and delicately sponging it, and the whole air was fragrant and aromatic with some ointment in the water. A long bandage or two lay on the ground beside the basin. The evening light over the opposite roofs through the window beyond mingled with the light of the tapers, throwing a strange radiance over the group. The table on which the tapers stood looked to Isabel like a stripped altar. She stood by the door, her lips parted, motionless, looking with great eyes from face to face. It was as if the door had given access to another world, where the passion of Christ was being reenacted. Then she sank on her knees, still watching. There was no sound but the faint ripple of the water into the basin, and the quiet breathing of the three. Lady Maxwell now and then lifted a handkerchief in silence and passed it across her son's face. Isabel, still staring with great wide eyes, began to sigh gently to herself. Anthony, 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 she whispered. Oh, no, 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 she whispered again under her breath. No, Anthony, you could not, you could not. Then from the man there came one or two long sighs, ending in a moan that quavered into silence. He stirred slightly in his mother's arms, and then in a piteous high voice came the words, Jesu, Jesu, esto mihi, Jesus. Consciousness was coming back. He fancied himself still on the rack. Lady Maxwell said nothing but gathered him a little closer and bent her face lower over him. Then again came a long, sobbing, indrawn breath. James struggled for a moment then opened his eyes and saw his mother's face. Mistress Margaret had finished with the water, and was now swiftly manipulating a long strip of white linen. Isabel, still sunk on her knees, watched the bandage winding in and out around his wrist and between his thumb and forefinger. Then he turned his head sharply towards her with a gasp as if in pain, and his eyes fell on Isabel. "'Mistress Isabel?' he said, and his voice was broken and untuneful. Mistress Margaret turned and smiled at her, and at the sight the intolerable compression on the girl's heart relaxed. 
"Come, child," she said, "come and help me with his hand. No, no, lie still," she added, for James was making a movement as if to rise. James smiled at her as she came forward, and she saw that his face had a strange look, as if after a long illness. "You see, Mistress Isabel," he said in the same cracked voice, and with an infinitely pathetic courtesy, "I may not rise." Isabel's eyes filled with sudden tears. His attempt at his old manner was more touching than all else, and she came and knelt beside the old nun. "'Hold the fingers,' she said, and the familiar old voice brought the girl a stage nearer her normal consciousness again. Isabel took the priest's fingers and saw that they were limp and swollen. The sleeve fell back a little as Mistress Margaret manipulated the bandage, and the girl saw that the forearm looked shapeless and discolored. She glanced up in swift terror at his face, but he was looking at his mother, whose eyes were bent on his. Isabel looked quickly down again. There, said Mistress Margaret, tying the last knot, it is done. Mr. James looked his thanks over his shoulder at her as she nodded and smiled before turning to leave the room. Isabel sat slowly down and watched them. This is but a flying visit, Mistress Isabel, said James. I must leave to-morrow again. He had sat up now and settled himself in his seat, though his mother's arm was still round him. The voice and the pitiful attempt were terrible to Isabel. Slowly the consciousness was filtering into her mind of what all this implied, what it must have been that had turned this tall, self-contained man into this weak creature who lay in his mother's arms and fainted at a touch and sobbed. She could say nothing, but could only look and breathe and look. Then it suddenly came to her mind that Lady Maxwell had not spoken a word. She looked at her, that old wrinkled face with its white crown of hair and lace, had a new and tremendous dignity. There was no anxiety in it, scarcely even grief, but only a still and awful anguish towering above ordinary griefs like a mountain above the world. And there was the supreme peace, too, that can only accompany a supreme emotion. She seemed conscious of nothing but her son. Isabel could not answer James, and he seemed not to expect it. He had turned back to his mother again, and they were looking at one another. Then in a moment Mistress Margaret came back with a glass that she put to James' lips, and he drank it without a word. She stood looking at the group an instant or two, and then turned to Isabel. "'Come downstairs with me, my darling. There is nothing more that we can do.' They went out of the room together. The mother and son had not stirred again, and Mistress Margaret slipped her arm quickly round the girl's waist as they went downstairs. In the cloister beneath was a pleasant little oak parlour, looking out onto the garden and the long south side of the house. Mistress Margaret took the little hand lamp that burned in the cloister itself as they passed along silently together, and guided the girl through into the parlour on the left-hand side. There was a tall chair standing before the hearth, and as Mistress Margaret sat down, drawing the girl with her, Isabel sank down on the footstool at her feet and hid her face on the old nun's knees. There was silence for a minute or two. Mistress Margaret set down the lamp on the table beside her, and passed her hands caressingly over the girl's hands and hair, but said nothing, until Isabel's whole body heaved up convulsively once or twice, before she burst into a torrent of weeping. "'My darling,' said the old lady in a quiet, steady voice, "'we should thank God instead of grieving.' to think that this house should have given two confessors to the church father and son yes yes dear child i know what you are thinking of the two dear lads we both love well well we do not know we must we must trust them both to god it may not be true of anthony and even if it be true well 
he must have thought he was serving his queen. And for Hubert... Isabel lifted her face and looked with a dreadful, questioning stare. Dear child, said the nun, do not look like that. Nothing is so bad as not trusting God. Anthony, Anthony, whispered the girl. James told us the same story as the gentleman on Sunday, went on the nun. But he said no hard word, and he does not condemn i know his heart he does not know why he is released nor by whose order but an order came to let him go and his papers with it and he must be out of england by monday morning so he leaves here to-morrow in the litter in which he came he is to say mass to-morrow if he is able mass here said the girl in the same sharp whisper and her sobbing ceased abruptly yes dear if he is able to stand and use his hands enough they have settled it upstairs isabel continued to look up in her face wildly ah said the old nun again you must not look like that remember that he thinks those wounds the most precious things in the world yes and his mother too i must be at mass said isabel god means it now now said mistress margaret soothingly you do not know what you are saying i mean it said isabel with sharp emphasis god means it mistress margaret took the girl's face between her hands and looked steadily down into her wet eyes isabel returned the look as steadily yes yes she said as god sees us then she broke into talk at first broken and incoherent in language but definite and orderly in ideas and in her interpretations of these last months kneeling beside her with her hands clasped on the nun's knee isabel told her all her struggles disentangling at last in a way that she had never been able to do before all the complicated strands of self-will and guidance and blindness that had so knotted and twisted themselves into her life the nun was amazed at the spiritual instinct of this puritan child who ranged her motives so unerringly dismissing this as of self marking this as of god's inspiration accepting this and rejecting that element of the circumstances of her life steering confidently between the shoals of scrupulous judgment and conscience on the one side and the hidden rocks of presumption and despair on the other these very dangers that had baffled and perplexed her so long and tracing out through them all the clear deep safe channel of god's intention who had allowed her to emerge at last from the tortuous and baffling intricacies of character and circumstance into the wide open sea of his own sovereign will it seemed to the nun as isabel talked as if it needed just a final touch of supreme tragedy to loosen and resolve all the complications and that this had been supplied by the vision upstairs there she had seen a triumphant trophy of another's sorrow and conquest there was hardly an element in her own troubles that was not present in that human pieta upstairs treachery loneliness sympathy bereavement and above all the supreme sacrificial act of human love subordinated to divine human love purified and transfigured and rendered invincible and immortal by the very immolation of it at the feet of god all this that the son and mother in their welcome of pain had accomplished in the crucifixion of one and the heart piercing of the other this was light opened to the perplexed tormented soul of the girl a radiance poured out of the darkness of their sorrow and made her way plain before her face my isabel said the old nun when the girl had finished and was hiding her face again this is of god glory to his name i must ask james leave 
and then you must sleep here to-night for the mass to-morrow the chapel at maxwell hall was in the cloister wing but a stranger visiting the house would never have suspected it opening out of lady maxwell's new sitting-room was a little lobby or landing about four yards square lighted from above at the further end of it was the door into her bedroom this lobby was scarcely more than a broad passage and would attract no attention from any passing through it the only piece of furniture in it was a great tall old chest as high as a table that stood against the inner wall beyond which was the long gallery that looked down upon the cloister garden the lobby appeared to be practically as broad as the two rooms on either side of it but this was effected by the outer wall being made to bulge a little and the inner wall being thinner than inside the two living rooms the deception was further increased by the two living rooms being first wainscoted and then hung with thick tapestry while the lobby was bare a curious person who should look in the chest would find there only an old dress and a few pieces of stuff this lobby however was the chapel and through the chest was the entrance to one of the priest's hiding holes where also the altar stone and the ornaments and the vestments were kept the bottom of the chest was in reality hinged in such a way that it would fall on the proper pressure being applied in two places at once sufficiently to allow the side of the chest against the wall to be pushed aside which in turn gave entrance to a little space some two yards long by a yard wide and here were kept all the necessaries for divine worship with room besides for a couple of men at least to be hidden away there was also a way from this hole on to the roof but it was a difficult and dangerous way and was only to be used in case of extreme necessity it was in this lobby that isabel found herself the next morning kneeling and waiting for mass she had been awakened by mistress margaret shortly before four o'clock and told in a whisper to dress herself in the dark for it was impossible under the circumstances to tell whether the house was not watched and a light seen from the outside might conceivably cause trouble and disturbance so she had dressed herself and come down from her room along the passages so familiar during the day so sombre and suggestive now in the black morning with but one shaded light placed at the angles other figures were stealing along too but she could not tell who they were in the gloom then she had come through the little sitting-room where the scene of last night had taken place and into the lobby beyond but the whole place was transformed over the old chest now hung a picture that usually was in lady maxwell's room of the blessed mother and her holy child in a great carved frame of some black wood the chest had become an altar isabel could see the slight elevation in the middle of the long white linen cloth where the altar stone lay and upon that again at the left corner a pile of linen and silk upon the altar at the back stood two slender silver candlesticks with burning tapers in them and a silver crucifix between them the carved wooden panels representing the sacrifice of isaac on the one half and the offering of melchizedek on the other served instead of an embroidered altar frontal against the side wall stood a little white covered folding table with the cruets and other necessaries upon it there were two or three benches across the rest of the lobby and at these were kneeling a dozen or more persons motionless their faces downcast there was a little wind such as blows before the dawn moaning gently outside and within was a slight draught that made the taper flames lean over now and then isabel took her place beside mistress margaret at the front bench and as she knelt forward she noticed a space left beyond her for lady maxwell a moment later they there came slow and painful steps through the sitting-room and lady maxwell came in very slowly with her son leaning on her arm and on a stick there was a silence so profound that it seemed to isabel as if all had stopped breathing she could only hear the slow plunging pulse of her own heart james took his mother across the altar to her place and left her there bowing to her and then went up to the altar to vest as he reached it and paused a servant slipped out and received the stick from him 
the priest made the sign of the cross and took up the amice from the vestments that lay folded on the altar he was already in his cassock isabel watched each movement with a deep agonizing interest he was so frail and broken so bent in his figure so slow and feeble in his movements he made an attempt to raise the amice but could not and turned slightly and the man from behind stepped up again and lifted it for him then he helped him with each of the vestments lifted the alb over his head and tenderly drew the bandaged hands through the sleeves knit the girdle round him gave him the stole to kiss and then placed it over his neck and crossed the ends beneath the girdle and adjusted the amice then he placed the maniple on his left arm but so tenderly and lastly lifted the great red chasuble and dropped it over his head and straightened it and there stood the priest as he had stood last sunday in crimson vestments again but bowed and thin-faced now then he began the preparation with the servant who knelt beside him in his ordinary livery as server and isabel heard the murmur of the latin words for the first time then he stepped up to the altar bent slowly and kissed it and the mass began isabel had a missal lent to her by mistress margaret but she hardly looked at it so intent was she on that crimson figure and his strange movements and his low broken voice it was unlike anything that she had ever imagined worship to be public worship to her had meant hitherto one of two things either sitting under a minister and having the word applied to her soul in the sacrament of the pulpit or else the saying of prayers by the minister aloud and distinctly and with expression so that the intellect could follow the words and assent with a hearty amen the minister was a minister to man of the word of god an interpreter of his gospel to man but here was a worship unlike all this in almost every detail the priest was addressing god not man therefore he did so in a low voice and in a tongue as campion had said on the scaffold that they both understood it was comparatively unimportant whether man followed it word for word for and here the second radical difference lay the point of the worship for the people lay not in an intellectual apprehension of the words but in a voluntary assent to and participation in the supreme act to which the words were indeed necessary but subordinate it was the thing that was done not the words that were said that was mighty with god here as these catholics round isabel at any rate understood it and as she too began to perceive it too though dimly and obscurely was the sublime mystery of the cross presented to god and as he looked down well pleased into the silence and darkness of calvary and saw there the act accomplished by which the world was redeemed so here this handful of disciples believed he looked down into the silence and twilight of this little lobby and saw that same mystery accomplished at the hands of one who in virtue of his participation in the priesthood of the son of god was empowered to pronounce these heart-shaking words by which the body that hung on calvary and the blood that dripped from it there were again spread before his eyes under the forms of bread and wine much of this faith of course was still dark to isabel but yet she understood enough and when the murmur of the priest died to a throbbing silence and the worshippers sank in yet more profound adoration and then with terrible effort and a quick gasp or two of pain those wrenched bandaged hands rose trembling in the air with something that glimmered white between them the puritan girl too drooped her head and lifted up her heart and entreated the most high and most merciful to look down on the mystery of redemption accomplished on earth and for the sake of the well-beloved 
to send down his grace on the catholic church to strengthen and save the living to give rest and peace to the dead and especially to remember her dear brother anthony and hubert whom she loved and mistress margaret and lady maxwell and this faithful household and the poor battered man before her who not only as a priest was made like to the eternal priest but as a victim too had hung upon a prostrate cross fastened by hands and feet thus bearing on his body for all to see the marks of the lord jesus lady maxwell and mistress margaret both rose and stepped forward after the priest's communion and received from those wounded hands the broken body of the lord and then the mass was presently over and the server stepped forward again to assist the priest to unvest himself lifting each vestment off for father maxwell was terribly exhausted by now and laying it on the altar then he helped him to a little footstool in front of him for him to kneel and make his thanksgiving isabel looked with an odd wonder at the server he was the man that she knew so well who opened the door for her and waited at table but now a strange dignity rested on him as he moved confidently and reverently about the awful altar and touched the vestments that even to her puritan eyes shone with new sanctity it startled her to think of the hidden catholic life of this house of these servants who loved and were familiar with mysteries that she had been taught to dread and distrust but before which she too now was to bow her being in faith and adoration after a minute or two mistress margaret touched isabel on the arm and beckoned her to come up to the altar which she began immediately to strip of its ornaments and cloth having first lit another candle on one of the benches isabel helped her in this with a trembling dread as all the others except lady maxwell and her son were now gone out silently and presently the picture was down and leaning against the wall the ornaments and sacred vessels packed away in their box with the vestments and linen in another then together they lifted off the heavy altar stone mistress margaret next laid back the lid of the chest and put her hands within and presently isabel saw the back of the chest fall back apparently into the wall mistress margaret then beckoned to isabel to climb into the chest and go through she did so without much difficulty and found herself in the little room behind there was a stool or two and some shelves against the wall with a plate or two upon them and one or two tools she received the boxes handed through and followed mistress margaret's instructions as to where to place them and when all was done she slipped back again through the chest and into the lobby the priest and his mother were still in their places motionless mistress margaret closed the chest inside and out beckoned isabel into the sitting-room and closed the door behind them then she threw her arms round the girl and kissed her again and again my own darling said the nun with tears in her eyes god bless you your first mass oh i have prayed for this and you know all our secrets now now go to your room and to bed again it is only a little after five you shall see him james before he goes god bless you my dear she watched isabel down the passage and then turned back again to where the other two were still kneeling to make her own thanksgiving isabel went to her room as one in a dream she was soon in bed again but could not sleep the vision of that strange worship she had assisted at the pictorial details of it the glow of the two candles on the shoulders of the crimson chasuble as the priest bent to kiss the altar or to adore the bowed head of the server at his side the picture overhead with the mother and her downcast eyes and the radiant child stepping from her knees to bless the world all this burned on the darkness with the least effort of imagination too she could recall the steady murmur of the unfamiliar words 
hear the rustle of the silken vestment the stirrings and breathings of the worshippers in the little room then in endless course the intellectual side of it all began to present itself she had assisted at what the government called a crime it was for that that collection of strange but surely at least innocent things actions words material objects that men and women of the same flesh and blood as herself were ready to die and for which others equally of one nature with herself were ready to put them to death it was the mass the mass she had seen she repeated the word to herself so sinister so suggestive so mighty then she began to think again if indeed it is possible to say that she had ever ceased to think of him of anthony who would be so much horrified if he knew of hubert who had renounced this wonderful worship and all she feared for love of her and above all of her father who had regarded it with such repugnance yes thought isabel but he knows all now then she thought of mistress margaret again after all the nun had a spiritual life which in intensity and purity surpassed any she had ever experienced or even imagined and yet the heart of it all was the mass she thought of the old wrinkled quiet face when she came back to breakfast at the dower house she had soon learnt to read from that face whether mass had been said that morning or not at the hall and mistress margaret was only one of thousands to whom this little set of actions half seen and words half heard wrought and said by a man in a curious dress were more precious than all meditation and prayer put together could the vast superstructure of prayer and effort and aspiration rest upon a piece of empty folly such as children or savages might invent then very naturally as she began now to get quieter and less excited she passed on to the spiritual side of it had that indeed happened that mistress margaret believed that the very body and blood of her own dear saviour jesus christ had in virtue of his own clear promise his own clear promise become present there under the hands of his priest was it indeed this half-hour action the most august mystery of time the lamb eternally slain presenting himself and his death before the throne in a tremendous and bloodless sacrifice so august that the very angels can only worship it afar off and cannot perform it or was it all a merely childish piece of blasphemous mummery as she had been brought up to believe and then this puritan girl who was beginning to taste the joys of release from her misery now that she had taken this step and united a whole-hearted offering of herself to the perfect offering of her lord now her soul made its first trembling movement towards a real external authority i believe she rehearsed to herself not because my spiritual experience tells me that the mass is true for it does not not because the bible says so because it is possible to interpret that in more than one way but because that society which i now propose to treat as divine the representative of the incarnate word nay his very mystical body tells me so and i rely upon that and rest in her arms which are the arms of the everlasting and hang upon her lips through which the infallible word speaks and so isabel in a timid peace at last from her first act of catholic faith fell asleep she awoke to find the winter sun streaming into her room and mistress margaret by her bedside dear child said the old lady i would not wake you earlier 
you have had such a short night but james leaves in an hour's time and it is just nine o'clock and i know you wish to see him when she came down half an hour later she found mistress margaret waiting for her outside lady maxwell's room he is in there she said i will tell mary and she slipped in isabel outside heard the murmur of voices and in a moment more was beckoned in by the nun james maxwell was sitting back in a great chair looking exhausted and white his mother with something of the same look of supreme suffering and triumph was standing behind his chair she smiled gravely and sweetly at isabel as if to encourage her and went out at the further door followed by her sister mistress isabel said the priest without any introductory words in his broken voice and motioning her to a seat i cannot tell you what joy it was to see you at mass is it too much to hope that you will seek admission presently to the catholic church isabel sat with downcast eyes his tone was a little startling to her it was as courteous as ever but less courtly there was just the faintest ring in it in spite of its weakness as of one who spoke with authority i i thank you mr james she said i wish to hear more at any rate yes mistress isabel and i thank god for it mr barnes will be the proper person my mother will let him know and i have no doubt that he will receive you by easter and that you can make your first communion on that day she bowed her head wondering a little at his assurance you will forgive me i know if i seem discourteous went on the priest but i trust you understand the terms on which you come you come as a little child to learn is it not so simply that she bowed her head again then i need not keep you if you will kneel i will give you my blessing she knelt down at once before him and he blessed her lifting his wrenched hand with difficulty and letting it sink quickly down again by an impulse she could not resist she leaned forward on her knees and took it gently into her two soft hands and kissed it oh forgive him mr maxwell i am sure he did not know and then her tears poured down my child said his voice tenderly in any case i not only forgive him but i thank him how could i not he has brought me love tokens from my lord she kissed his hand again and stood up her eyes were blinded with tears but they were not all for grief then mistress margaret came in from the inner room and led the girl out and the mother came in once more to her son for the ten minutes before he was to leave her end of chapter eleven